Okay. Okay, so we're live on Facebook now as well. So good afternoon, everyone. This is what the F is going on in Latin America, Code Pink's 20 minutes of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean airing every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we stream live on Facebook. We will also be recording this and posting on our YouTube channel that we're building. So today I am really honored to introduce to all of you and have a conversation with Leone Ermiten. Did I say that correctly? Ermiten, yeah. Ermiten, okay. I'm still getting my Spanish accent correct. So now you're, <laughs> and now I have to learn a little French and a little Creole. <laughs> and, um, so I'm really honored to have Leone here with us because I had a chance to meet her yesterday. Um, at a hearing regarding Haiti. It was a US House of Representative Committee on Foreign Affairs and the hearing was entitled, Haiti on the Brink, Assessing US Policy Towards a Country in Crisis. And um, I'll attach the link on um, our Facebook as well. So all of you can, if you're interested, you can listen to the full, I think it was almost two hours of um, testimony. It was quite profound. And Leone was one of the witnesses yesterday afternoon. She is Haitian. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, you were born in Haiti, raised in New York City, and she spent 20 years of grassroots community um, building in Miami's Haitian community. But she has a very impressive resume that um, I want to share with you briefly before we start talking about yesterday's hearing and the historical events that led up to many of the issues brought up yesterday. So she, um, I'll just go through this really quickly and you can jump Please. in and, and, <laughs> add, tell, and add details as you like. You're so uh, visiting professor at FIU School of Architecture, executive executive director of Haitian America Foundation, director of research and strategic planning at Santla, where you are back at Santla now. Mm -hmm. Um, she returned to Haiti um, as director of Lambi Fund of Haiti, which focuses on Haitians, uh, Haiti's rural poor and is a community-led fund. Um, you also have your own consulting firm. You're very impressive. Thank <laughs> you. And um, what have I forgotten? You have your own- Well, your nothing, but, but really everything that I've done has been focused on um, Haiti and the Haitian community and really strengthening um, our capacity both here uh, and in Haiti to improve our lives. That's been, I've been very fortunate that um, I've had the opportunity to do that for most of my professional life. Well, it's a, it's a profound body of work and, and let's talk a little bit about your heritage as a Haitian. One of the things that um, yesterday's hearing, I have to tell all of you in the audience, I was sharing this with Leone before we went live, that we've covered the last several weeks um, with our webinars, um, the uprising in Ecuador, in Chile, and now Bolivia. And really, quite frankly, we, we would have been most correct to have started a year ago um, in the streets of Haiti. I mean, you've been leading, the Haitian people have been leading um, street activism and protest against um, your sitting government um, the longest in this past year, I, but I would argue the longest in the, in the history of America as defined by mm -hmm. um, the United States, 300 years, um, starting with the French. So Larry, let's talk a little bit about yesterday's hearing in Congress um, it was titled um, Haiti on the Brink, Assessing U.S. Policy Toward a, a Country in Crisis, why you were um, in, invited as a witness and what your takeaway of the hearing yesterday was. Um, I was invited by Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, who is from South Florida, uh, because Congresswoman, um, you know, South Florida has the largest Haitian population in the United States in terms of the diaspora. Um, there are over 200,000 Haitian Americans living in South Florida, 
and she understands very well that um, Haiti and Haiti's development, Haiti is linked to the diaspora for multiple reasons. For, first of all, you know, we, we, most of many of us are from Haiti and we, you know, when Haiti, as they say, when Haiti coughs, we sneeze. Um, and we provide in terms of remittances over 30% of the GDP. Last year alone, um, we sent over $3 billion in remittances to Haiti. So we know that for emotional and economic reasons, we're tied to Haiti. And yet, we're never invited around the table when it comes to discussing um, solutions for Haiti. Those of you in the diaspora are not yes. included. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Haitians, Haiti's own people aren't included. Right. In and world. American citizens. And let, American let me citizens. add that we're American yeah. citizens and yet- Funding the projects fund, with funding, our tax dollars. In, you know, investing heavily in, the, in, in Haiti. And yet we, you know, with 3 billion, I guess I would say that we are the largest investors in Haiti. Um, there are no international organization, no, no international donor that can match our contribution. And yet um, our, pers uh, our vision, our perspective, uh, the creativity of our solutions are never, never addressed by the, by the United States or the international donor community. So let's talk about some of the, some of the deeply rooted issues that, that, that you and your people want to address. One of the things that um, I shared with you before we went live was that I think it was, I think April of 16, I had mentioned that I was in Haiti and I had a chance to visit um, at the US Embassy and we got a nice little PowerPoint presentation showing how much US tax dollar investment there has been made in Haiti. And the gentleman doing the presentation said, oh, you know, X, Y, Z amounts for these projects. And he said, I have to be very candid, the return on investment has been very poor. And of course, that was just a, an appalling thing for us to hear, you know, what that inferred on many levels. And so you and I were saying that the solutions keep coming from the same institutions and the same people. Right. And it, with, without consultation with really the people of Haiti, I mean, I, I remember uh, once post earthquake, I was staying at a hotel and I was sitting next to this woman who was asking me questions. And I sort of probed her and said, what are you doing? And she was working for USAID or one of those organizations doing judicial reform, working on judicial reform in Haiti. And so I kept asking her, have you, and she's writing a report. And there's another gentleman, a, a, an academic from the US university. And they were both talking about you know, the program. And so I kept asking, did you talk to so-and-so? Did you talk to so-and-so? And they didn't even know who the local players were. So of course their projects are gonna fail uh, because again, uh, there is no real investment in understanding what the, the realities on the ground uh, is. So the realities on the ground are your specialty, your, your life's work. Can you um, share with us some of the community projects, funds that you've been involved with on the ground in Haiti? I, I've worked, I've been very fortunate to work with great organizations on the ground. Uh, one of them was the Lambi Fund of Haiti, which is an organization that supports grassroots initiatives, not in the traditional, I'm going to tell you what you need kind of way, but in the manner of um, we will support your own initiative. So we would go to we go to rural communities and are approached by uh, community based organizations, real local stakeholders who tell us that they need to in order to become sustainable uh, farmers, they need an investment, you know, for example, in a grain mill in an irrigation system. And so the Rambi fund provides the fund with the proviso that the organization itself manages the fund. So what Rambi used to do does is to offer training to the farmers so that they can manage the fund, they can execute the project. That was, that was one of the most profound, most um, educational experiences in my life as a Haitian 
because I got to travel throughout the country and really meet um, the people of Haiti. Uh, recently, I've worked in a, with a small network of schools, again, all Haitian led, focusing on education as the, the passport out of poverty, but also as a means to build civic leaders. And so I work with ProDev, um, an educational uh, organization in Haiti, and that, was, that also was very rewarding. Uh, to be in an institution where children were treated with respect, teachers were treated with respect, and the schools, uh, the ProDev schools provided um, all children, especially in very, living in challenging conditions, um, the opportunity to be in an enriching environment where they were treated as human beings worthy of receiving quality education. So these, gosh, these are really, we could spend all day talking about these projects and how profound they are to, to creating um, a nation of people, your own nation Absolutely. of people. Yeah, from the ground up, not from investment top oh, down. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's another great foundation in Haiti called Focal that I've worked with. And they, I mean, they have um, created this urban park in in the heart of one of the most dangerous gang, quote unquote, infested neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince in Martissan. And that is also one of the proudest uh, experiences of my life is to see the interaction between the park and the people of this neighborhood who basically been forsaken uh, because of the, the fear uh, generated by gang activity. So it's, I, I've really, been very lucky um, in terms of Haiti and even in my work here in Miami's Haitian community. Let me um, let me ask you. There was a couple of things. Oh gosh, I'm thinking like of five things all at once to ask you here. Mm -hmm. um, the gang-related activity that mm -hmm. is due to what in many places throughout Latin America and the Caribbean we see it as a result lack of economic oh, poverty? development. Yeah lack of lack of uh, hope you know clearly when you have a population where over 50 percent of the current population is under the age of 25 um this is what you sort of call a bonus a demographic bonus in, in most countries because having such a young population allows you through education and training to envision what you want to be in the future and really build that country's capacity through its youth. But you have a country where there is an, you know, to call it inadequate is, 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 is a gross misstatement, where you have a very dysfunctional educational system, very class um, driven, you know, because if you have money, you get some education, and if you don't, you're doomed to not be educated. And so, and you have that population, that youthful population having access to the internet, having access to social media and having the ability to project themselves into uh, societies that are much more affluent and much more respectful of their citizens. So that generates anger that is also fueled by um, politicians a lot of politicians are arming their own gangs uh, in the absence of, with, you know, a police force of 9,000 for a country of, of uh, 11 million. You understand that protection is not always uh, guaranteed. And so you have a lot of politicians who are arming their own gangs for their own purposes, businessmen arming gangs for protection. And so People With taking the, the free, law into their own hands, the basically. Free flow, and the free flow of arms and guns and ammunition from the United States doesn't help either. Um, and so you have young, you, know, you have 15 year olds walking around with the latest piece of automatic, um, you know, rifles, automatic guns. So it's, it's very distressing to see the waste of a the human young capacity. generation yeah this is you know this is something that um, me personally i you we see in my travels at my work in mexico and honduras as well mm -hmm. um this arming of gangs of 
unemployed, particularly of the young people. This is something that came up. We touched it was touched on a little bit uh, in yesterday's hearing and specifically the national police force. There were some comments yesterday that the current president wanted to build a military mm -hmm. in Haiti. The U.S. Uh, obviously is opposed to that. That that was mentioned several times quite overtly yesterday. But there was conversation about developing, expanding the national police force. And this is right. this body of 9,000 that you meant, just mentioned? Nine or 15,000. Nine or 15, uh, yeah, 15, but very small. But still very small. But, you know, as Pierre Esperance said, it, it's a group that has become much more professional. And so the violence that has been perpetrated in massacres, for example, in neighborhoods like La Saline is not necessarily attributed to the police but to the emerging paramilitary forces that are doing um, elected officials bidding by trying to silence uh, some of the most uh, vocal opposition. Let's so, talk about La Saline and what happened there and how that has been um, some, a, a, a lightning rod for some of the protesting going on. Well, La Saline is a neighborhood, um, one of those neighborhoods that we have a high concentration of poverty, of unemployment, of uninhabitable dwellings. You know, you have, when you go there, um, you know, you want to compare it to the favelas in, in, in Brazil, but it's really not even close to uh, comparable. You have, ten, you have uh, shacks, basically, people living in shacks. Uh, really horrible conditions, um, but a very high concentration. As uh, people left the countryside and moved to the city, you know, Port-au-Prince was built for a population of 500,000. I think that right now, and it's a, it's a very, it's, it's, uh, there is not more, much room for, for expansion uh, because geograph I mean, it's, it's surrounded by mountains. And so um, the, the high concentration of poverty, the high concentration of population, as I said, people have left the countryside in droves and have moved to Port-au-Prince. And so they live in what people call ghettos. And La Saline, just like Cité Soleil, is one of those uh, neighborhoods. And again, um, where you have a lot of gangs and a lot of um, political, the, the hotbed of political dissent. And so um, as demonstrators have put the city on what they call lock, you know, lockdown, um, uh, the paramilitary forces have uh, gone into the neighborhood of La Saline and basically massacred um, young people, massacred raped women, uh, really wreaked havoc and inflicted um, incredible violence uh, on that community. Um, the problem is that there is still no investigation. Those who have perpetrated these crimes are known, but yet uh, the justice system has yet to um, act on uh, the accusations and the evidence presented. And so uh, it's another continuum um, sign of impunity. And that's, you know, pro protesters are, are always clamoring for, you know, they want justice, they want the rule of law. And La Saline is an absolute wonderful example, not wonderful, but an important example of what happens in the country where there is no rule of law. So this is a country with no rule of law being heavily funded by the United States and various aid organizations. And maybe we should talk about why that's so. I think in the opening statements yesterday, there was a comment made that um, to me basically summed up the geopolitical role of Haiti and, and why the United States basically tolerates funding. Um, a government that operates with impunity, not unlike funding Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, and that statement was um, that Haiti 
the current government of Haiti recognizes the um, quote unquote interim government of Venezuela under Juan Guaido, and that also Haiti is a trading partner with Taiwan as opposed to mainland China. And, and also taking a position in Nicaragua that is aligned with the United States vision. Yeah. So yes, there was a statement that for political, geopolitical reasons, um, Haiti was not, well, the president of Haiti, the current um, Jovenel Moise's administration was considered an ally, an important ally. And so in that regard, there's almost, uh... There's, um, I'm not sure how to correctly say this without being offensive to some people in the audience, that the funding from the U.S. and related aid organizations continues to come regardless of the cry from the people on the streets for a more humane and just society. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think with the exception of President Aristide, if I recall, uh, money has always flowed into Haiti um, the question is, how is it invested, whether it's come in or not, what difference has it, has it made? And that's was, uh, that was part of my opening statement yeah. when I said that um, while, um, you know, the protests had been clamoring for um, accountability in Haiti for, you know, how the petro funds were spent or, or not spent, um, uh, uh, talking about corruption and how many politicians siphoned um, a lot of these funds out of the country. Our concerns as the diaspora was uh, about how the USAID invested the funds, what were the returns of investment, and you know we still don't understand. There's very little transparency as to how these funds have actually benefited Haiti. If you look at 30 years of investments, um, we're talking about billions. I mean, Petro Caribe's three billion. I, I, I dread to know what the actual numbers are in terms of US investment in Haiti. And, and as we say, we don't, as taxpayers, we have not yet been given a full picture as to what the returns on our investments are and why um, we keep investing in bad policy, in bad strategy or ineffectual strategies. Because we don't step out of the box, as you and I were saying earlier. That they, we keep referring issues to the same institutions and the same Well, the question the is, people. do we want to step out of the box? I exactly, mean, I think that yes. these are very smart people yeah. who understand that if a strategy doesn't work, something else should be tried. And I know that there have been multiple parties, either diaspora concerns who have presented them with alternatives. And so, you know, you begin to, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, regardless of the political party, um, there's been this reluctance to change uh, strategies, to think outside the box. And most likely for geopolitical reasons and self-enrichment and all those other uh, financial um, ties to corruption, mm -hmm. et cetera. One of, um, now, there was a potential for elections in Haiti in January, is that my understanding? Um, and, possibly, but doubtful. And one, uh, what would elections accomplish, if anything? I know there well, was- what's gonna, what's gonna happen is that by law, the members of parliament are gonna be out. There should have been elections in, there should have been elections this fall to replace um, members of parliament who are term limited. Uh, because there were no elections, uh, the, the parliament is going to be, there will be no quorum, there will, be, there will not be enough members uh, present to make any decisions. And so the president is going to be ruling by decree, unless something miraculous happens between now and mid-January, um, there will be no, there are probably not going to be election and the president will rule by decree. So the country's, I mean, a, a sole leader, is that what, is that what With that no means? With no accountability. With no dictator. Lack of accountability. Yeah.
factor uh, is going to be wow. exponentially greater now that wow. as per the constitution um when there is no quo on the president will rule by decree so yeah wow a dictator basically um I'll say it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, you don't have to. <laughs> um, but it's kind of, you know, yeah, it's like, wow, it's so that the, yeah, the government lies in the hands of one of one person. So let me ask you about uh, elections in Haiti, because this did come up yesterday as well. And there that there would be potentially be a call for elections. And that that isn't necessary. There were some comments that that wasn't necessarily what was needed. That, um, and I think you and I had said that uh, you know equating elections with democracy is, is is a fallacy. Yes, and it's and it's sort of intentional because the parties know that the system as it is, and as it is supported by, and let, let's just say that it is a system that is supported by by the um, international community. Um, in, term, in order to encourage elections, free and fair elections, the international community has provided financial support to parties um, involved in the election so that anyone who can bring together a group of people, create a platform um, and have a name uh, can have a party, which is which gets a nominal support. I think something I don't remember the numbers, but between fifteen to twenty thousand um, dollars of financial support. That's not enough to run real elections, but for for um, folks who just want to make some money, uh, that's a great opportunity. And so, at um, around election time, you have a whole cottage industry of parties that emerge and, of course, disappear after the elections. Uh, during the last uh, presidential elections, we had something like 75 parties um, just emerge. Uh, there are about two or three or four parties that have um, a history of members and activities of platforms. But for the, the most part, these new parties just come up they just they're pop up parties. <laughs> pop up parties, I like pop that. Pop up parties, yes. <laughs> and so and so the international community loves to point to these things and say, see, you know, there is all this civic engagement, citizens engagement, uh, there's an exchange of ideas, but that's not the case. Uh, the case uh, it's a money-making it's, it's a travesty. <laughs> it's an absolute travesty. Wow. And for the last elections, um, President Moise won by with 500,000 vote, votes in a country where there are about 5 million registered voters. Wow. Wow. So... so um, the people in the streets demanding a change in government, I think it's, you know, it's, you've given us a much clearer picture as to why. I, um, when, I entered, when I introduced this conversation today, I mentioned that, you know, we've been, folk, we've, we've started with the people rising in Ecuador, Chile, and now um, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. But Haitians have been in the streets for the last 18 months, but also for the last, couple centuries. I yes. mean, the Haitian is so let's talk a little bit briefly in the few minutes we have left, if you can give us a brief history of Haiti. And, and you're such the beacon of example for fighting for national sovereignty and national identity. And so maybe you can, can you share some of that history with us just so our, our viewers can have yeah. a better uh, you know, Haiti, quickly, Haiti shares this island called Hispaniola, which I hate, I hate that term Hispaniola, um, with the Dominican Republic. Haiti, uh, so Haiti was uh, colonized by the French and the Dominicans by the Span Spaniards. Uh, Haiti was the, uh, the reason why it's called the Pearl of the Antilles, actually, it's because it was the richest 
possession of the French Empire in terms of because of its sugar pr production. And you know that when you're talking about sugar, you're talking about labor, slave labor at the time. And so um, Haiti was this huge plantation system that produced uh, sugar, which enriched uh, many of the emerging bourgeoisie, French bourgeois, and, and led to the overthrow, the French Revolution, actually. Um, and so um, it was this unheard of event that uh, enslaved people, Af enslaved Africans, um, recognize their own rights to humanhood and to liberty and, and basically arm themselves, organize themselves into indigenous armies and overthrew uh, the French uh, government. Uh, Napoleon's first defeat was not in Waterloo, but it was definitely in Haiti, in Saint-Domingue at the time. And so we were the first to defeat Napoleon. We were the first to create our own independent nation, uh, a nation that was truly founded on the notion that all people were, um, had the right to their humanity and to their freedom. And we even supported other efforts throughout Latin America, namely Bolivar um, in um, greater Colombia, which Colombia. is now yeah. Venezuela. Um, Venezuela, to, Colombia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, Ecuador yeah. to become independent. And that has, you know, labeled us, we were considered the cancer of the Americas because we were not only um, independent black, uh, independent black nation, but we believed in exporting <laughs> that notion. I mean, when we invaded the Dominican Republic, the first thing that we did was to uh, free the slaves. And so um, the, we, we were targeted by multiple initiatives for failure. First by the French who crippled our economy, you know, the international community. We were, we were quarantined, we were embargoed. And so we we're not able to trade with anyone. And so the French demanded that we pay quote unquote reparations uh, for the loss of the sugar, for the loss of the sugar, the plantation, mm -hmm. and the slaves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, or property. Yeah. Slaves property. Slaves were property. And so and Haiti was forced to not only pay the debt, but also sign an agreement with the Vatican, uh, which imposed uh, religious education in most of our elite. Uh, educated in um, schools um, run by, by the Catholic Church. And so in addition to having to pay a debt, we were also forced to bring the colonizers back <laughs> to educate our children. And um, that is followed, of course, by multiple attempts at occupation, not just from the, you know, from the Germans, uh, and then uh, in the early 1900s, we were in, there was an American occupation which lasted about 30 years, where again, there was a major effort to suppress um, indigenous uh, forces of resistance, not just in terms of armed resistance, but cultural resistance as well. Uh, you will see increased attacks on our religion a religion that has been the foundation of our spirit of independence, freedom, and that's voodoo. And during the American occupation, I have to say that uh, the Marines who landed were all from the deep South. They were Jim Crow products of the Jim Crow system. And so the ferocity, their, their attacks on our people, on our culture, uh, was an incredible effort to take um, away from us uh, this, our spirit of, 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 of liberty. And so uh, because of Haiti's position as a geopolitical, geopolitical position, um, you know, moving forward in terms of Cuba, um, 
the dictatorship that emerged in the 19, in late 50s, early 60s was um, viewed as an ally uh, because uh, again, uh, it, um, it, was a, it was sort of the polar opposite of Fidel Castro in a way. Uh, and so, um, well, ideologically opposite to Fidel Castro. Right. Um, so American intervention has continued throughout that time, whether it be through financial support, uh, technical support, and you know, it's it's just too much for me to encompass in one conversation. No, of course. I have to say that uh, American intervention, American assistance has been with us forever. And one, the other interesting thing that they brought in the with the last occupation was also the missionaries. Um, the missionaries have, have uh, also had a very negative impact on Haiti. So, you know, what, what you're describing to us is I just want to say first, it's just, it's so significant that the Haitian people were the first to throw off the, the, the yoke of slavery and free yourself from the French empire. It was, it, this is something most mainland US citizens do not understand. And it's a profound um, lesson to learn from the Haitian people and to understand. But so much of what you've just described to us, we see right now, well, I would, argue, I would argue since November 10th, playing out in Bolivia, hmm. that this persecution of the indigenous people, getting rid of their culture, their, their religious practices, um, their relationship to the land and their, their self-reliance on the land, all of that is, is in full vision hmm. there right now. It's the same, it's the same historical playbook. Hmm that we continue to see throughout this hemisphere. So I wonder if there's, in just cl in closing this conversation, gosh, Leonie, I could talk with you all afternoon. I'm, it's, just, it's just fascinating to be with you. Is there um, one or two books that you could recommend to our viewers to give them, you know, okay. a, a good- uh, well in one one recent book that I usually recommend is uh, Bob McGuire's uh, Who Owns Haiti? Uh, There's so many books that I can't, uh, anything by Wolf Truyo, um, Patrick Bellegard Smith, um, but, but who owns Haiti? Um, Bob McGuire is a really good, it's not too voluminous. It's not a lot of reading. It's a reader, there are different perspectives, but it's really, it's a very good book to get an, an understanding of what's the current, Haiti's current landscape. Okay, terrific. I will put that, um, uh, in the comments on our Facebook Live uh, mm -hmm. video. And I'm also gonna share with the audience uh, the link to yesterday's hearing. We had some um, really significant comments from um, witnesses and also was really interesting, um, a relief to me to hear so many comments on the panel from the con congressional members. Yes. A few on the uh, uh, Republicans as well really um, against U.S. interventionism in mul in multiple forms. It was, mm -hmm. it was I've never heard so many uh, in one hearing mm -hmm. be so against U.S. foreign policy on a, in a nation, and that that was that was a that was a relief to hear. Yes. Yeah. Now we just have to do something with it. Yes. <laughs> with those opinions. So. Okay, everyone, I'm going to let Leonie go now. Thank you so much. You gave me much more time than I had asked you for, and I'm so appreciative of it. And Thank I look you. forward to further conversation with you. And um, we'll be back uh, next week for the audience. We'll be Code Pink will be in Cuba, and we will be airing uh, What the F is Going On in Latin America, 12 p.m. Eastern, live from Havana next week. So another Thank Caribbean you. island with a profound yes. history. So. Yes. Okay, Leone, thank, thank you so bye much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Oof.